welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather. We are in the kitchen this morning and I am up much earlier than normal because I could barely sleep last night. I was so excited. Just kind of like a kid on Christmas morning, I just could not stop thinking about this cheese. So this is actually the first hard cheese that I've ever made and I haven't been wanting to venture into hard cheeses because I've seen some people spend a long time on something and then I spend a long time waiting the curing process can be a year or more sometimes and then be disappointed in the result. And I just didn't want to do that. I didn't want to spend that many months waiting just to learn that I had done it wrong this whole time. So this is a Colby cheese and it only takes four to six weeks to cure. So that I can get on board with for some of my first cheeses. Wow. So it did stick just a little bit to my muslin here. But look at this. So this is made from our goat's milk and it is colored with annatto. So it's got that lovely yellow cheese color. And what I need to do now that everything is pressed is check and make sure that it's still a little bit bouncy. It is. And I need to stick it in a salt brine for eight hours. So I've pre-made my brine over here. I'm not doing a cheese tutorial for a while. I wanna know that I kinda half know what I'm doing before I go ahead and make a video on it. But I'm still really excited and I wanna share this with you. Cut the cheese. It's not salted right now, but this, this brine is heavily salted. I'm just gonna set this down in and they said it would float. It does. You got some babies out, Mama. Good morning. Everybody is smashed in the kidding area. Oh, his feet So my goats do not like mornings. <laughs> they tend to sleep in pretty hard. I recently just started doing a much earlier than normal milking routine because it's already starting to get really hot outside during the day. So if I can get my milking done by about 8.30 in the morning, that's good. I'm gonna miss the heat of the day. And honestly, I feel like it brings more hours into the day where I can do things like make that cheese. This is definitely the time of year where I have to make sure that I'm preserving something from the farm um, every single day. Otherwise, I'm gonna get behind. And we have what I like to think of two seasons here on our farm. We have protein season and we have vegetable season. Protein season is a little bit longer and both seasons do overlap. I never am without my vegetable season and I'm never without my protein season. So we're dealing with pickling eggs and preserving eggs right now, a lot of preserving dairy, and we do still have some meat rabbits growing. But it's also undeniably garden season. I'm gonna be doing another update garden tour. So we'll come through the garden a little bit later. I'm not gonna do a full, you know, bit by bit whole garden tour, but there's so much going on that I really wanna show you guys. So as far as today, I think I think on my agenda for preservation, I need to do some more pickled eggs. I know a couple of you asked about my pickled egg process and I'll be happy to share that with you. Are you ready? <laughs> Calamity, she still has her buckling on her because he's less than a week old, but she's been giving us a whole ton of milk. And that reminds me too, I had mentioned during Elpis' birth that I milk my does 24 hours after having kitted. And I had somebody ask a very valid question. They said, well, does, don't her triplets need all of that milk? Yes, they absolutely do. So when I say that I milk my does 24 hours after giving birth, what I'm trying to achieve is removing the excess that the kids don't take. So we do a kid share here where we separate the kids for 12 hours 
at night and then milk mamas in the morning and then the babies have their mama all day. We do not start that process until the babies are two weeks old. And with triplets, I may even wait until three weeks. It just kind of depends. We've got a goat, Margie, who had triplets and has been making a surplus of milk ever since that they were born. Alpas and our other mama with triplets, barely, they don't make a whole lot extra, which is actually quite normal. Um, me putting them on the stand just helps get them used to the routine so that when I do start, that kid share process they're pretty well into the routine and it's not a huge struggle because I don't get a whole lot out in the very beginning they're not on the stand for very long and those little snippets of training those really short sessions are really good for them so like I mentioned Miss Calamity here she's less than a week fresh right now less than a week since she had her baby and so I'm not currently kid sharing with her little buckling but she does make a whole ton of milk and if I didn't milk her alongside him from the very beginning what would happen is that her body would adjust the milk volume to the demand of the baby and with triplets that's really not a big deal it's not a problem not very often do they make more than what triplets can can eat but especially with singles and oftentimes with with twins if you don't keep up on the milk supply that they have at the very beginning their body is going to adjust and you could wind up getting a little bit less milk later on so to help keep her milk supply up we're going to be milking her today and she's gotten very used to the routine moment I'm getting about two gallons a day so I'm milking nine does but a lot of them still have very young babies on them and a lot of them I'm not doing the kids share quite yet because the babies are so young um, three of the does are Nigerian dwarfs so they have a little bit of a lower milk volume than somebody like this so considering the circumstances, I think two gallons a day is pretty good. Um, it only takes two gallons to make one of those Colby cheeses. So if I'm getting two gallons a day, 14 gallons a week, that's quite a lot of cheese. We are making a lot of kefir. We are feeding Tori, our bottle baby. And I have been supplementing triplets um, a little bit here and there, just to make sure that they're going to be getting everything that they need. So it has been the eight hours for the brine on the cheese and it's got a nice, rind going on and now from what I understand I just let this kind of air dry for a couple days flip it every once in a while and then I'm going to let it cure or ripen in our wine fridge over there for about six weeks four to six weeks we'll see at about uh 53 ish degrees so I'm cautiously optimistic I really hope this works out but at this point, it's actually time to do our preservation of the day, which is the pickled quail eggs. So what I'm gonna be doing today is technically rebel canning. Now, pickling eggs isn't against any kind of rules, but you really should keep them in the refrigerator and not keep them on the shelf. I break a little bit of a rule here and I am comfortable pickling my eggs and canning them with my steam canner and leaving them on the counter. Now, just because I do it doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that you should do. I want you guys to do independent research and decide what's gonna be best for you in your home. And what I do is actually pretty simple. I've got a couple different pickling recipes that I love when I have fresh dill in season. My dill is only about this big in the garden and we'll look at that in a little bit. But when I don't have fresh dill, I really like to use these Mrs. Wages pickle packs. And I genuinely, all I do is use the recipe that's on the back of this and apply it to my pickled eggs. So my secret to getting fresh eggs nice and cleanly peeled is actually to use my electric pressure cooker right here. This is the new wave version, but you can use your Instant Pot or whatever. I put it on the steam setting and for quail eggs, I steam them for one minute and for regular chicken eggs, I steam them for two minutes. Now there is the heat up phase and the cool down phase and the eggs definitely cook during those phases as well, but I get a really nicely cleanly peeled egg and that's really important for a canned pickled egg you don't want to use any eggs with any nicks or cracks or anything like that so I've only got eggs in here that have a nice smooth surface 
I'm going to be canning in half pint jars today and each jar has about 9 to 11 quail eggs kind of depending on the size but I've tried to keep the level of egg underneath this lip here. I'm going for a half inch head space so I'm going to have a half inch of air space between the top rim of the jar and the food or the brine and so I'm just going to be filling up to that point. Now what I'm gonna to wanna to do is actually clean the rim of the jars so that our lids will seal nicely. So I'm not actually gonna do a canning tutorial today. I do have canning tutorials and I'm gonna link them at the end of this video. Today and most days during the summer, I am using the steam canner. I do a lot of things with my steam canner. It's my absolute favorite way to preserve food. So it looks like one of my little jars doesn't fit in the canner, which is completely fine. This, like I mentioned before, can be a refrigerator pickle recipe. What you're gonna wanna do is leave this in the refrigerator to marinate for about two weeks, and then the full flavor should be in the eggs. But for the rest of these, what I'm gonna do is use my steam canner like I love to do. These are gonna steam for 10 minutes. While we're on the topic of preserving, uh, you might remember a couple vlogs ago, a handful of vlogs ago, I had fermented some asparagus. So I let this sit kind of long, um, but I'm not sad about it. It's very, very good. Here's one of our little asparagus fronds. It doesn't have the same kind of firmness that it did, but I can guarantee you if I were to pickle this, like I'm pickling these eggs, that it would not have this level of firmness. So there's a really great benefit to fermenting things. They tend to retain a lot of crispness and being fermented, they are very, very nutritious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it tastes good. It's one of the issues that I have sometimes with fermenting is it all kind of ends up tasting the same. I feel that way about a lot of pickled things and that's essentially what this is. It's just pickled in a salt brine but in a fermented way so that's actually healthier than your regular pickles. One of these days I will probably ferment eggs. I know you can do that. I just haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> So I feel like these peas just exploded in one week. I feel like it was literally just last week that I showed you guys like the first flower. See these beautiful pea flowers here, gorgeous. And now these plants are absolutely loaded. So this is the first time that I'm growing shelling peas. I've grown a lot of sugar snap peas in the past. The whole goal with these guys is to leave them on the plant to get nice and fat and juicy and then we'll pick them and have peas, just shelled peas. So we've got this trellis over here, which isn't doing as well as this one over here. I actually double sewed this row over here because birds were getting to them. And we don't eat a lot of peas. So even though this looks like a lot of plants, it's not gonna give us a huge ton of peas, but it'll get us a few chicken pot pies worth. That's for sure. They're all decently flat at the moment still, but you can see the little peas starting to form on the inside. One of the reasons that I wanted to grow peas on these trellises here specifically was I had a lot of heavy feeding plants on these trellises in the last couple of years. And peas are actually what's known as a nitrogen fixer. What they do is they take the nitrogen out of the air and put it into their leaves. And when we're all done with the peas, what we'll do is put the peas into the bed so they can put that nitrogen right back into the soil and help feed the bed. They don't take a whole bunch of energy out of the soil, but they can put quite a bit back. Also over here in the kids garden I noticed that not only are these plants getting really big but we have our first tomato blooms of the season. These plants that the kids found as volunteers are mystery tomatoes. We don't really know what is going to come out of these plants and I had assumed that most of them would be cherry tomatoes but I can kind of tell by looking at some of these trusses on some of these flowers that there are some bigger tomatoes here. See this set of trusses here? These are spaced pretty far apart, which to me says that these are gonna be supporting larger tomatoes. In contrast to that, you can see how close together these flowers are on this truss. This is likely a cherry type tomato. See this one here? It's another cherry type, most likely. But this one here, I don't know. It's gonna be interesting. 
Also, this is not the first year that I've grown potatoes. Actually, this year is the first year that I didn't intentionally grow potatoes, but here it is. It's a volunteer from potatoes that were accidentally left in the ground from last year. But it's funny, in the several years that I have grown potatoes, I've never seen them flower. I know that some people will time their harvests of their potatoes depending on when they flower, but I'd never seen that happen, so I just always waited for the plants to die back. See, I've got a potato flower over here, and you can really tell with the blooms that potatoes are nightshades. See how similar this flower looks compared to that tomato flower we just saw? Really pretty look. So like I mentioned before, we're not gonna go through the whole garden because I am gonna do a garden tour in the next few days. But if you missed our first garden tour of the season, I'm gonna put that video up here. If you'd like to know more about steam canning, I've got this video here. And if you wanna know a little bit more about fermenting, I've got this video up here. 